Okay, let's see. Do I have anything for the start? Mm, nope, other than Crow is still cool. And apparently still drunk. <laughs> when is he ever not drunk? Case in point. Also, for those who probably haven't seen episode four yet, there will be spoilers. Hello, I'm Lux. And I'm Ember. And this is our thoughts and catch up on Ruby, season four, episodes one through four. Yeah, time got away from us, so we had to binge the first four episodes. <laughs> Not that we're complaining, but sometimes real life kind of eats all your free time. I remember what free time was. No, wait, I don't. That mystical thing where you have can do things that you want to do instead of having to adult. Ouch, adult. Oh yes, I'm doing that all the time now. Damn you, adult! <laughs> uh, but now to the actual series. Speaking of growing up, damn has this series grown up thanks to them using... Don't think it's... I think it's Maya? Maybe? I can't remember. It's a different software now. They were using Poser before, and now they're using either Maya or... No, it's probably my, I, think, I don't think it's 3D Max. And it certainly shows, though some of the older character models don't really work in the new art style yet. Like, for me, Mercury and... Are we sure it's Emerald? Because we got it wrong last time. Yeah, because I kept wanting to call her Gemini. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Mercury and Emerald don't really look right with the new style and the new lighting to me. But everyone else, especially the ones who have gotten updated designs with new clothing and stuff like that look really good in this new style. I think some of the characters that haven't gotten design updates, they may have just ported the existing models and not done a lot of reconfiguring yet. Mm -hmm. Well, I must say Crow still looks good and his sister looks really good in this new art style. She looked cool before, but now she really looks cool. Yes, I definitely don't want to meet her in a dark alley or a brightly lit one for that matter. And using a software like Maya really allows them to do stuff they weren't able to do before. Because I always found it odd that they used Poser, which I'm like, I didn't realize that was even animation software. I thought it was just something you could pose 3D models in and look at or render out a single solid image. I didn't realize you could actually do an entire animation in. So it's kind of nice that they've upgraded to Maya, which also means their budget probably increased. That's probably another reason they went with Poser, because it was probably cheaper. Well, look especially at the beginning episodes of season one. Most of the background characters were just black shadow outlines. Mm -hmm. Which they actually regret doing now, even though it was a way to save on budget. It was in one of the interviews with the creators. I watched this 107 facts on Ruby. Those are always fun. Mm -hmm. Especially when you actually don't know most of the facts. That's also fun when you're like watching, I was like, wow, I knew almost all of these. <laughs> But going back to the actual first episode of this season, that was an interesting way to start the season off with the bad guys. Also, I'm not quite sure if I like the crazy villain guy or not. I usually like the crazy villain characters, but something about him seems... I think the best way I can describe it is too generic. Yeah, I felt like I had seen him before. I was like, where was he previously in this series? Because he doesn't feel new. And it's because he's the basic... Eye for an eye, revenge-driven, sadistic, male warrior type. Looney Tune. Yeah. I'm more interested in the guy who didn't speak much in those meetings. The big, brooding guy. The one who was like, ah, oh, the girl with silver eyes. We've dealt with her type before. Yeah, and I'm wondering if that's referring back to her mother or even further back. I would really like to know because we have Osben noticing Ruby has silver eyes in the first episode. And the season one intro song, We Are Lightning, Striking from the Thunder... Yes, I know I got that line slightly wrong. Miracles of ancient wonder. So how ancient is the silver-eyed power? Mm -hmm. And it could be referring to these artifacts that were just brought up. Yes, the relics are something we didn't really hear about before. We knew we were looking for maidens. We didn't know we were looking for relics. Yeah, I'm like, this is new. And is that sword Raven is using? Is that an artifact? Because she can cut through space. I'm not quite sure about time yet. Is the mask she's wearing that gives her that ability instead? Because I'm not quite sure because that helmet seemed to be very important. Because Crow kept grabbing it, that seemed to prevent her from leaving. Yeah, which means it's kind of important. It also seems like he doesn't like touching it either. Because he wouldn't put his glass down until she moved it. Mm-hmm. And there was plenty of room for him to put the glass down. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just a glass. Also, we jumped from episode one to episode four, but that's okay because we pretty much just finished watching episode four because when we were binging the first three episodes, episode four actually didn't come out yet. 
well, it was out, but it was down behind that first day paywall. Yeah, that we don't quite have the funding to support Rooster Teeth that much. We already buy their t-shirts and figurines. <laughs> and DVDs. We just don't have enough spare scratch for a monthly subscription on top of everything else. Even though it's a very reasonable monthly subscription. It's hugely reasonable. Very reasonable. If you guys have the scratch and want to support Rooster Teeth, go do that. Mm -hmm. If not, at least watch a couple episodes with an ad blocker off. Because those are cost per view. So even just viewing the ad will give them money. And the computer can't tell if you're actually there looking at it. Just go in the other room and get a soda. Like you would actually do when you were younger. Wait a minute. Damn millennials. Because <laughs> <laughs> when I was a kid, you had these things called commercials you couldn't skip. You had to get up off your butt and go to the kitchen and get something. Though sometimes the commercials would be shorter than you were expecting, so by the time you got back, your show was already halfway through, and when you sat down, another commercial came on! I'm a little concerned at how well you did that. <laughs> huh. How do you think I feel? <laughs> Probably more disturbed than I do. So, please, back to Ruby? <laughs> uh, but... A lot of interesting things going on. Kind of like this kid named Oscar. People are theorizing that he is actually the Spring Maiden. Which would be interesting because we have heard Crow mention things with a male Spring Maiden and how awkward it was. Though I still say maybe Ruby. Mm. Because she has the Rose thing going. I know people think Rose is Summer, but for those of us who know Old World Roses, Rose is Spring. Though the only thing that kind of brings a a wrench into the little plans of Ruby being one of the Maidens is it sounds like Silver Eyes are not compatible with Maidens. So entirely possible. Also, if she was actually a Maiden, I think Osborne would have kept a tighter leash on her. But if they managed to kill the Spring Maiden, is she an inheritor? Or has the Spring Maiden already been killed and she's an inheritor of the power? Mm -hmm. Now that I brought that up, I think Silver Eyes were a counter to the Maidens. Because if you think about it, if you give them that much power, wouldn't there naturally be an opposite force to them? You would think, but we need a World of Remnant video about the Silver-Eyed Warriors. I know we got some Silver-Eyed Warriors story at the end of Season 3, but, you know, the World of Remnant videos give us a lot of extra information. I'm enjoying Crow narrating them this season. Mm -hmm. And I also found it very interesting that if the Maidens are weak against Silver-Eyes, just like the Grimm... Could the Grimm be a byproduct of the Maidens? But there were Grimm around before there were Maidens. I don't know. There is no timeline on when the Maidens were created. They didn't say when the Maidens were created in the in the backstory videos that we saw. No, not in the backstory video and not when Osbin was telling or sharing the Maiden story with Pyrrha while they were having that discussion. And even though it was light, who knows? Well, you know, if you go back to the earlier World of Remnant videos, it sounds like we weren't anything until we had Dust. So I think we mastered Dust before we got Maidens. And we had Grimm back before we had Dust. That's why we kept dying. Hmm. I'm just bringing it up because it would be an interesting thing that the Grimm are actually byproducts of the Maidens. So the Maidens were actually first, and then the Grimm came along because of them, and then humans. Because it doesn't look like the Maidens were actually human at the time either. The only human was the old man. Yeah, we don't know what the biological makeup of the original Maidens were. So they could have been anything, including Fae, assuming this world has Fae. Because hmm. they were elemental forces, because each was associated with a season. Hmm. Back to the actual episode of this season. I was planning on doing theorizing at the end of the video, but this works! <laughs> you could always move it to the end. Yeah. Probably not. So I really like the start off of introducing the villains first, especially we have some new villains. There's that interesting thing of Cinder getting severely injured and possibly losing an eye and her left arm being damaged. Yeah, I'm impressed that she survived considering the power that I think Ruby unleashed. Mm-hmm. Considering it froze huge Grimm in place like stone. And it also looks like the larger Grimm actually isn't the one that's attracting the other Grimm. It sounds like Salem is actually sending more Grimm there herself. 
Yeah, it's kind of creepy that Salem seems to be like in league with the Grimm. Because that staff thing she had looked a lot like a Grimm of some sort. Staff thing? That floaty thing when she was grilling Cinder in the third episode. It looked more like a giant floating crystal ball to me. Yeah, but it had Grimm coloration. Yeah, that's what I meant. It's like It looked like, it's like, like a staff, as you described it, and more like a giant floating crystal ball to me. Yeah, but the fact that it didn't actually have a staff portion and that it moved around on its own and that yeah. Mercury and Emerald and Cinder were all freaked by it. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is a Grimlike creature. I like how they're suddenly introducing stuff like that. Like that one, speaking of the first episode again, cutting right to the next scene where Ruby and team are talking about their names and fourth wall breaking. Junior, it sounds better and cooler. I think Ranger works better. Yeah, and then the objection that neither of them is a color. And I didn't really think about the team names being color because to me, Juniper is a berry, but I guess Juniper would be the color of the berry. And Team Sun, obviously the color of sunlight. Yeah, it uh, it's more like they're supposed to sound like colors, like Ranger kind of sounds like a color, kind of like red Ranger. <laughs> okay, I did not realize that until just now. Uh, yeah. Red Ranger. That's actually kind of awesome. Mm -hmm. Especially since Ruby's red. <laughs> yes. But I mean, really, they're kind of a mishmash team. They lost one member of their team. Ruby lost three members of her team. So you guys are kind of just teaming up to make a four-person team and help Ruby with whatever her mission happens to be. Also, really love the updated design of Ren with the longer hair. He mm -hmm. looks even cooler now. Though I did like his short hair, and in terms of cosplay, it'd probably still be easier to do the short hair, but he also looks stronger now. Mm -hmm. And I also like Ruby's updated design is nice because it actually has elements of a lot of different characters, they said. Like, there's supposed to be hints of Pyrrha in her outfit as well, like how Jean's outfit mm -hmm. actually literally has elements of Pyrrha in it, at least her outfit. And I'm... Ooh! I'm trying to remember what object dropped off and hit the ground after Cinder incinerated Pyrrha. I'm not sure. Maybe her headpiece? I'd have to go back and look. I think it was her headpiece. And I think that's part of the metal the guy was talking about. Along with, I think he actually has Pyrrha's sword or he had his sword reworked to be... I think his sword was reworked to incorporate the other metal because they made upgrades to the weaponry. Mm -hmm. But his sword and shield were family items, so he wouldn't discard them. But he would upgrade them. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Yeah, it was in the first episode, too, where... Uh, I'm not quite sure if I'd like the scene or not, because I'm like, that is funny, but would Ruby really laugh that much at John's shirt? <laughs> it seemed a bit overdone. It seemed more Ruby chibi than Ruby canon. Because mm -hmm. I only really laughed at the end when she was already on the floor and... And Ren goes, well, I guess you can't, can't give up everything from your childhood. And then her legs come up, which goes, <laughs> again. That made me laugh. The rest of us are like, you're just being annoying now, Ruby. Shut up, please. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Come on. He's your tactician. Give him a little respect. <laughs> Speaking of that, yeah, you're the tactician. You're, you'll be fine without a weapon. <laughs> yeah, I don't ever want to face a monster without a weapon. Ever. Oh, I'm just glad they didn't hit him in the groin two times in that scene. They hit him once in the groin and then once in the head. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to remember what else they focused on in that episode. Let's see. I think it was just Team Ruby, and we didn't get a hint of any of the other teams until the very end when we switched over a Wise. Mm -hmm. Seeing her back on the family estate. Mm -hmm. Definitely a caged bird. Mm -hmm. Also, I really do not like her brother. Yeah, I was going to say, switching over to episode two. Uh, his current character, from what we've seen of him so far, basically screams at me, closeted ass. Yes, and the thing is, he looks slightly nicer in the intro when he's in the background with Clive. Mm -hmm. But the minute he came on screen in the episode, I'm like, I do not like you. Yeah, and something interesting is about Clyde. His personality changes with his eye color. And what's really interesting is one of the people I was watching watched the episode actually said he that his personalities reminded him of the seven dwarfs. Grumpy, the red eyes, Sneezy, the blue eyes, and maybe Doc for his brown, which seems to be his natural color. 
So are there more personalities that we haven't seen yet? Very interesting. And butlers in large households tend to be interesting characters. Yes, the butler did it. <laughs> As they often seem to be on the side of the young girl within the household. Mm. As we see in this, where he brings wise a nice warm beverage after having to deal with her icy father and then manages to make her laugh mm -hmm. also ironwood he's cleaned up pretty well though he seems to be really busy because he hasn't seemed to have shaved much considering he was clean shaven throughout all of season was it just three or is he also in two i can't remember but being a military guy usually they're clean shaven because that helps keep you healthy you know less hair for things to get into mm-hmm but, you know, if there's something you're going to let slide during the whole fall of Beacon mm -hmm. and while you're working the council to, you know, keep the dust exports and to do other uh, safety items and deal with the people who are upset about those safety items and don't see the need for them or can't see past their own interest. Cough, father, cough. Yes, and then forcing Wise into that concert. Though it's interesting because if you think back to the white trailer, mm -hmm. her performance in the white trailer is twofold. We have part singing and part fighting. Mm -hmm. Well, those are two different places. She was actually fighting and then she was performing the concert because we were switching back and forth in time in that trailer. Yes, but it's interesting to see something that's coming up now that was reflected in the white trailer. Yeah, well, all of the trailers are actually canon. I know they're canon. I'm just saying it's always interesting to see something incorporated, especially something that gave hints. Mm -hmm. And what's really um, nice, too, is the fact that the voice actor for Wise actually does all the singing in the intros. Else was going on. Let's see. We haven't covered Blake and Sun yet. No, I'm, I, I'm going. I'm actually trying to go mostly canonical now. <laughs> you mean chronological. Chronological now. I was also going, like, what else did we? Yeah, we ended because the trailer, not trailer, the Episode 2 ends with Clyde and... No, wait. There's also parts of Episode 2 where we cut back to Ruby and the group. And we find the, that town mm -hmm. that was ransacked by bandits and then the Grimm came. Yes. And we see really interesting reactions for both Ren and Nora. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking this harkens back to what happened to their parents and stuff like that. Because based on stuff I read and heard online, their parents were killed. They're both orphans. Makes a lot of sense, especially if they were either villagers in a you know smaller town or huntsmen and huntresses themselves. Mm -hmm. Also, both of them seem to recognize that particular shape of grim footprint. Yes, and very definitely did not make mention of it to the other two members of their team. Mm -hmm. And that specific grim footprint kind of reminded me of a demon, how the cloaked hoof looks. Okay, now episode three where we move on to mostly focus on Blake and Yang. Ah, Blake's on a boat. I thought cats didn't like water. <laughs> Only certain species of cats. Tigers do go swimming, you know. Mm-hmm. And I've known of several house cats that love swimming in the tub. Just check YouTube. <laughs> ah, the moment I saw the guy in the hood, I was like, that's son. I might not have thought that if I hadn't have watched the intro. Yes, because the intro gives away that Sun is with Blake and that Sun's a tag along. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure the two people we see in the trailer, the big guys, Blake's father and the other person, I'm pretty sure is Blake's mother. She looks awfully young to be Blake's mother. I'm hoping it's Blake's mother because I'd like to see both parents, but I theorize sister. Ah, <sighs> poor Sun, hug and then shove. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, he wasn't invited, but as he said, he's already on the boat. Mm -hmm. My favorite part of that particular encounter is after the big fight with the dragon, the grim dragon, is the, I'm son! No! Slow down, slap him right in the face. Yeah, he totally deserved that. Also the reference to um, Journey to the East. Uh, several references, and it's Journey to the West. I thought he said east. He says east, mm. but the actual story is Journey, Journey to, to the, the west. west. His character itself is already a reference to the Monkey King, so mm -hmm. just continuing it on from there. That was really fun. Also, yes, Blake, you're a little paranoid, but why did you throw your bow in the water? That's littering, girl. <laughs> I'm like sitting there going, that's the thing you talk about? Not the fact that it's a symbolism of 
her letting go of hiding? Well, she's headed back to a Faunus territory. Nagery, which sounds like menagerie, which, wow, really, it's named for what a grouping of animals is. <laughs> Serious creators do like their puns. Mm -hmm. That fight scene was actually pretty cool, too. Though I'm like, I have a feeling they were going to ram them, but aren't they worried about damaging the boat by ramming it into a grim and then shooting it? I know it's kind of like letting the person stab you and going, ha, I got you, and then killing them, but... Well, would you rather risk the boat by managing to get a killing shot, or do you like the Grim to just kill you? Hmm. Good point. Also, I love the fact that apparently that cannon's really powerful because it blew the entire top of the Grim off. Yeah, nice. Uh, I really like how they did the fight scene with uh, Sun and Blake. I really like how they teamed up, and I really like how we saw more of how Blake uses her double ganger to actually fling herself further. And I love how Sun was like standing there with his arms open, like, I'm going to hug her or something, and then run on his head and leaps off of him. Mm -hmm. Sun wasn't entirely ready for Blake's tactics, and Blake wasn't entirely happy to have him helping. And that also showed in their fighting choreography. Mm -hmm. I think it's because she feels that she hurts everyone around her right now and that anyone around her who she considers a friend is in danger. Mm -hmm. Also the whole how dare you follow me. Mm -hmm. I don't care what your intentions are, I'm probably going to be annoyed that you were stalking in the shadows. Unless you're a crow because skipping forward to episode 4, that was awesome. <laughs> yep, and we'll mention it again because I'm going to go back to episode 3 and talk about Yang. <laughs> <laughs> and I really like how they're having her deal with the fact that she lost her arm and everything. And they had this whole thing between episode three and four where she's where she's accepting of her predicament and she accepts it more. And by the end of that, she accepted enough to actually try out the arm. I was kind of hoping she'd actually be without an arm. Not because we want her to suffer, but because she sees the arm as more of a crutch and she wants to strengthen herself and power through the change in her physiology. Mm -hmm. We're not saying there's anything wrong with using the technology or artificial limbs or any of that stuff. Yeah, I think I also accept it more because she had to fight to be comfortable with it. Yeah, instead of just, ooh, shiny, right out of the box, like we would be with the new game controller. Mm -hmm. We didn't just start the season again with her with her arm on and everything's better. No, she had to work through it. She had to, and she probably still has a lot to work through because I think she might be suffering from a little bit of trauma. I'm not just talking about physical trauma, I'm talking about emotional trauma still from the whole fact that Oh, my arm was chopped off by this evil guy, considering that dream in episode 4. Seriously. And speaking of dreams, going back <laughs> to Ruby again, of her being asleep and hearing Pyrrha call John, and then the second time that happens, she gets up and finds John training with a recording of Pyrrha, which really makes it nebulous of whether Ruby was actually hearing a, some spirit or remnant form of Pyrrha calling to John. Or if that was just her subconscious interpreting hearing the audio of Pyrrha's voice. Well, with the effect they used on it, I'm thinking it's actually something that Ruby's picking up and it's not a subconscious thing. Because we've seen dreams from other characters and this isn't the way the series stylizes dreams. I know, but I like how they added the recording in, both because of how it affects John and because of how it throws some doubt into what Ruby is sensing, even if only in her mind and not in the mind of the audience. Mm -hmm. Also, poor John. Uh, I, I know it's a training tool and it may also be him trying to still cope with her loss, but I don't know if that's going to help, man. <laughs> no, and I'm pretty sure you have enough practice that you could practice those moves without the recording. Especially that particular recording, because he now knows better the meaning of the end because being Jean, he probably just like, oh, that's just her being Pyrrha. Yeah, because Jean was pretty clueless about the fact that Pyrrha is seriously into him. Mm -hmm. And now he knows that that's more of something else. That she was truly trying to express and couldn't bring herself to say and now it's too late and it's so sad and he just keeps losing things. Apparently he's lost stuff 
prior to losing Pyrrha, because I don't think he's just talking about Pyrrha's loss in the fall of Beacon when he says he's tired of losing things. Mm-hmm. I like the stories about his family. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, he went here? We went there? I had to tell about myself because I was special. <laughs> and I was thinking, you were the only boy with seven sisters. Of course you had your own tent. But then it's like, yeah, because they wouldn't stop braiding my hair. Okay. Ah, <laughs> uh, not your style, huh? Yeah, I preferred more of a wolf's tail or wolf uh, warriors something. Mm -hmm. And Ruby goes, that's a ponytail. <laughs> I stand by what I said. Ah, uh, let's see. And as we were talking about it before, another thing that was in episode three was more stuff about the bad guys with Cinder and stuff like that. And it looks like she's getting maybe trained to use the power more or, or how to use the um, maiden's power more. Because of the way she got it, maybe it's different if you naturally got it the natural way. That was redundant. Maybe if you got it the natural way, maybe she has to learn to communicate through that creature that she used to get the powers from the maiden before. And she's afraid of it, so now she can't use the powers properly. Well, I think she has a lot to be afraid of considering the damage she took after acquiring the power. Though the two are separate items they happen very close together though bringing that back up maybe it wasn't the fact that she has the maiden's power that made her vulnerable to ruby maybe it was that creature she used to take the maiden's power yes because as far as we know she still has the spider creature because mm -hmm. that could be the thing there mm -hmm. huh, let's see i like the fact that we get to see the some of the professors again mm -hmm. and for life of me i can't remember the names right now <laughs> Oh, don't look at me for the names of teachers. I can't remember the names of my own teachers. <laughs> but yeah, it was the one who drinks coffee all the time and the uh, I'm bolsterous one. Even I get scared. Yeah, he's afraid of mice. I mean, look at their tails. <laughs> also, they're carriers of disease and... Uh, so yeah, and that episode mostly focused on family and Crow. Crow and his sister are like, interesting. Mm -hmm. And they're talking about artifacts, as we mentioned before, and that poor bar maiden. <laughs> yes. Also, it sounds like Raven's people were the ones who took out that town. Hmm. Because, you know, Crow talked about they were just a bunch of thieves and killers. Hmm. And Raven says, we didn't know the Grim were going to set in that quickly. Hmm. I didn't pick up on that. <laughs> yes, because she leads them now, and she'll do whatever she has to to ensure they survive. Hmm. And we just had that World of Remnant video about the bandits, mm. as told by Crow. And apparently that tribe raised both of them, and Crow deserted. Also notice Crow, Raven, both mm -hmm. blackbirds. Ah, carrion birds. Yes. Hmm. So now that we've wrapped up the episode talk with a bunch of theory to throw in, any more theories or any, any more thoughts on all these episodes are a whole and how the season's doing so far? Well, obviously the season is good. That's kind of a given. It's Ruby, and they had so much of the story plotted out that, you know, the it's on schedule, you know, on chart, on course, however you want to say. And I'm glad we saw Oscar again, because by the time we got to where he showed back up in episode four, I almost forgot that he was in episode one. Yeah, and he's kind of interesting, especially that scene where he's looking into the mirror. And he plays with his hair and goes, hello? And then the mirror answers. Says, hello, I'm Professor. And for a second, I thought it almost said Osbin, but I think it actually said Oscar. Mm -hmm. So I was like, is this some form of semblance? Is this some form of communication? Is it from his future self? Mm -hmm. Another interesting thing about his character design is his eyes look off in color. And the color of the eyes is supposed to be very important in Ruby. So all the eye colors have different meanings and stuff like that. Kind of like silver eyes. Well, Ruby's a bit of a Mary Sue. So of course she has to have a defining physical characteristic that's unusual like silver eyes. Mm -hmm. And then there's Oscar. Like I said before, I think he's the Spring Maiden. <laughs> so any more thoughts? <laughs> well, of course the Spring Maiden can be a guy. To go to Penny Royal Academy, Basil was a princess. <laughs> so then you read the second book. Yeah, tell me if the author gets over first book syndrome. <laughs> yeah, kind of. I think that book had a little other trouble with it by the fact that it started out as a, as a TV show script first and then was slowly converted over to being a book. So I think that also hindered it. Mm. So 
what are your final thoughts so far on these four episodes and any other theories? <laughs> Definitely enjoying it, and like I said, I always hate the I'm following you, but Sun was just hanging out in the shadows. Crow is actually being productive by protecting the group and taking care of most of the smaller Grimm that they would have run into. So he's more doing the watchful protector, where Sun was doing more of the stalker thing. And I do agree with you, that was really cool how they reintroduced him. <laughs> yes, because we saw him leave to follow Ruby at the end of season three and to see that he's still actively following her and doing something to help her without revealing himself. Because if she knew Crow was along, she would probably behave differently because there would be a false sense of security because her Uncle Crow is awesome. Yes, he is. Well, overall, I'm really liking the season so far. Once again, it's a bummer. There's only going to be 12 episodes, but hey, there'll be 12 awesome episodes. Ah. <sighs> And they're sprinkling in World of Remnant episodes in there, so that will extend it out. So that's cool. <sighs> There's so many theories going through my head, because I'd love to drop little hints here, and I'm paying more attention to especially the intro. Like, here's my theories on the intro, what the intro's pointing out. Like, I think by the end of the season, we're going to have all of Ruby, Team Ruby, back together, but not staying together. It's like a fight or something, and suddenly they're all in the same place. Yeah, I think it's going to be more of a meetup than a reconciliation. Mm hmm Because they have too much to go through all of them individually before they could just meet up and reconcile as a group because yang and blake have a lot of hurt between them and weiss going back to atlas and you know ruby's connection with all of them because yang's her sister blake's her friend her and weiss are like that stereotypical odd couple friendship mm -hmm. <sighs> overall i can't wait to watch the rest of the episodes well, I hope you've enjoyed our thoughts on Ruby Season 4, Episodes 1 through 4. Thank you for being a prompt, Miss Ember. <laughs> ah. Speaking of prompts, here's my prompt. Please subscribe. And if you want to see more of my art, you can find me on DeviantArt, Tumblr, and Twitter if you happen to have it. If you want to support me so I can do more art and maybe me and Ember can do more episodes, please head over to my Patreon or click the coffee link in the description if you don't feel like signing up for Patreon. <laughs> yeah, coffee's kind of cool because you don't have to have a subscription, you know, account with Patreon. You can do a one time, you can do increments. It was kind of cool. Check it out, even if you don't do it for our sake. And that's a wrap.